Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad Chapter 7 An outward-bound mail-boat had come in that afternoon, and the big dining-room of the hotel was more than half full of people, with a hundred-pound round-the-world tickets in their pockets. There were married couples looking domesticated and bored with each other in the midst of their travels. There were small parties and large parties, and lone individuals dining solemnly or feasting boisterously, but all thinking, conversing, joking, or scowling, as was their wont at home, and just as intelligently receptive of new impressions as their trunks upstairs. Henceforth they would be labelled as having passed through this and that place, and so would their luggage. They would cherish this distinction of their persons, and preserve the gum tickets on their portmanteaus as documentary evidence, as the only permanent trace of their improving enterprise. The dark-faced servants tripped without noise over the vast and polished floor. Now and then a girl's laugh would be heard, as innocent and empty as her mind. Or, in a sudden hush of crockery, a few words in an affected drawl from some wit, embroidering for the benefit of a grinning tableful the last funny story of shipboard scandal. Two nomadic old maids, dressed up to kill, worked acrimoniously through the bill of fare, whispering to each other with faded lips, wooden-faced and bizarre, like two sumptuous scarecrows. A little wine opened Jim's heart and loosened his tongue. His appetite was good, too, I noticed. He seemed to have buried somewhere the opening episode of our acquaintance. It was like a thing of which there would be no more question in this world. And all the time I had before me these blue, boyish eyes looking straight into mine, this young face, these capable shoulders, the open bronze forehead with a white line under the roots of clustering fair hair, this appearance appealing at sight to all my sympathies, this frank aspect, the artless smile, the youthful seriousness. He was of the right sort. He was one of us. He talked soberly with a sort of composed unreserve, and with a quiet bearing that might have been the outcome of manly self-control, of impudence, of callousness, of a colossal unconsciousness, of a gigantic deception. <laughs> Who can tell? From our tone we might have been discussing a third person, a football match, last year's weather. My mind floated in a sea of conjectures till the turn of the conversation enabled me, without being offensive, to remark that upon the whole this inquiry must have been pretty trying to him. He darted his arm across the tablecloth, and clutching my hand by the side of my plate, glared fixedly. I was startled. "'It must be awfully hard,' I stammered, confused by this display of speechless feeling. "'It is hell,' he burst out in a muffled voice." This movement and these words caused two well-groomed male globe-trotters at a neighboring table to look up in alarm from their iced pudding. I rose, and we passed into the front gallery for coffee and cigars. On little octagon tables candles burned in glass globes. Clumps of stiff-leaved plants separated sets of cozy wicker chairs— and between the pairs of columns, whose reddish shafts caught in a long row the sheen from the tall windows, the night, glittering and sombre, seemed to hang like a splendid drapery. The riding lights of ships winked afar like setting stars, and the hills across the roadstead resembled rounded black masses of arrested thunderclouds. "'I couldn't clear out,' Jim began." The skipper did. That's all very well for him. I couldn't, and I wouldn't. They all got out of it in one way or another. But it wouldn't do for me. 
I listened with concentrated attention, not daring to stir in my chair. I wanted to know, and to this day I don't know, I can only guess. He would be confident and depressed all in the same breath, as if some conviction of innate blamelessness had checked the truth writhing within him at every turn. He began by saying, in the tone in which a man would admit his inability to jump a twenty-foot wall, that he could never go home now. And this declaration recalled to my mind what Briarly had said, that the old parson in Essex seemed to fancy his sailor son not a little. I can't tell you whether Jim knew he was especially fancied, but the tone of his references to my dad was calculated to give me a notion that the good old rural dean was about the finest man that had ever been worried by the cares of a large family since the beginning of the world. This, though never stated, was implied with an anxiety that there should be no mistake about it, which was really very true and charming, but added a poignant sense of lives far off to the other elements of the story. "'He has seen it all in the home papers by this time,' said Jim. "'I can never face the poor old chap.' I did not dare to lift my eyes at this till I heard him add, "'I could never explain. He wouldn't understand.' Then I looked up. He was smoking reflectively, and, after a moment, rousing himself, began to talk again. He discovered at once a desire that I should not confound him with his partners in—in uh, in crime, let us call it. He was not one of them. He was altogether of another sort. I gave no sign of dissent. I had no intention, for the sake of barren truth, to rob him of the smallest particle of any saving grace— that would come in his way. I didn't know how much of it he believed himself. I didn't know what he was playing up to, if he was playing up to anything at all, and I suspect he did not know either, for it is my belief that no man ever understands quite his own artful dodges to escape from the grim shadow of self-knowledge. I made no sound all the time he was wondering what he had better do after— that stupid inquiry was over. Apparently he shared Briarly's contemptuous opinion of these proceedings ordained by law. He would not know where to turn, he confessed, clearly thinking aloud rather than talking to me. Certificate gone, career broken, no money to get away, no work that he could obtain, as far as he could see. At home he could perhaps get something— but it meant going to his people for help, and that he would not do. He saw nothing for it but ship before the mast, could perhaps get a quartermaster's billet in some steamer, would do for a quartermaster. "'Do you think you would?' I asked pitilessly. He jumped up, and, going to the stone balustrade, looked out into the night— in a moment he was back, towering above my chair, with his youthful face clouded yet by the pain of a conquered emotion. He had understood very well that I did not doubt his ability to steer a ship. In a voice that quavered a bit, he asked me why did I say that. I had been no end kind to him. I had not even laughed at him when— Here he began to mumble. That mistake, you know— made a confounded ass of myself. I broke in by saying rather warmly that for me such a mistake was not a matter to laugh at. He sat down and drank deliberately some coffee, emptying the small cup to the last drop. That does not mean I admit for a moment the cap fitted, he declared distinctly. No, I said. No he affirmed with quiet decision. "'Do you know what you would have done? Do you? And you don't think yourself—' He gulped something. "'You don't think yourself a—a a cur?' And with this upon my honour he looked at me inquisitively. "'It was a question, it appears—a bona fide question.' 
However, he did not wait for an answer. Before I could recover, he went on, with his eyes straight before him, as if reading off something written on the body of the night. It is all in being ready. I wasn't. Not... not then. I don't want to excuse myself, but I would like to explain. I would like somebody to understand. Somebody. One person, at least. You. Why not you? It was solemn, and a little ridiculous, too, as they always are, those struggles of an individual trying to save from the fire his idea of what his moral identity should be, this precious notion of a convention, only one of the rules of the game, nothing more, but all the same so terribly effective by its assumption of unlimited power over natural instincts, by the awful penalties of its failure. He began his story quietly enough. On board that Dale-Line steamer that had picked up those four floating in a boat upon the discreet sunset glow of the sea, they had been after the first day looked askance upon. The fat skipper told some story, the others had been silent, and at first it had been accepted— you don't cross-examine poor castaways you had the good luck to save, if not from cruel death, then at least from cruel suffering. Afterward, with time to think it over, it might have struck the officers of the Avondale that there was something fishy in the affair. But, of course, they would keep their doubts to themselves. They had picked up the captain, the mate, and two engineers of the steamer Patna sunk at sea— and that, very properly, was enough for them. I did not ask Jim about the nature of his feelings during the ten days he spent on board. From the way he narrated that part, I was at liberty to infer he was partly stunned by the discovery he had made, the discovery about himself, and no doubt was at work trying to explain it away to the only man who was capable of appreciating all its tremendous magnitude. You must understand he did not try to minimize its importance. Of that I am sure. And therein lies his distinction. As to what sensations he experienced when he got ashore and heard the unforeseen conclusion of the tale in which he had taken such a pitiful part, he told me nothing of them, and it is difficult to imagine. I wonder whether he felt the ground cut from under his feet. I wonder— but no doubt he managed to get a fresh foothold very soon. He was ashore a whole fortnight waiting in the sailor's home, and as there were six or seven men staying there at the time, I had heard of him a little. Their languid opinion seemed to be that in addition to his other shortcomings he was a sulky brute. He had passed these days on the veranda, buried in a long chair— and coming out of his place of sepulture only at meal-times or late at night, when he wandered on the quays all by himself, detached from his surroundings, irresolute and silent, like a ghost without a home to haunt. "'I don't think I've spoken three words to a living soul in all that time,' he said, making me very sorry for him. And directly he added— one of these fellows would have been sure to blurt out something I had made up my mind not to put up with, and I didn't want a row. No, not then. I was too... too... I had no heart for it. So that bulkhead held out after all, I remarked cheerfully. Yes, he murmured, it held and yet I swear to you I felt it bulge under my hand. It's extraordinary what strains old iron will stand sometimes, I said. Thrown back in his seat, his legs stiffly out and arms hanging down, he nodded slightly several times. You could not conceive a sadder spectacle. Suddenly he lifted his head, he sat up, he slapped his thigh, Oh, what a chance missed! My God, what a chance missed! He blazed out. But the ring of the last 
mist, resembled a cry wrung out by pain. He was silent again, with a still, far-away look of fierce yearning after that mist distinction, with his nostrils for an instant dilated, sniffing the intoxicating breath of that wasted opportunity. If you think I was either surprised or shocked, you do me an injustice in more ways than one. Ah, he was an imaginative beggar. He would give himself away. He would give himself up. I could see in his glance, darted into the night, all his inner being, carried on, projected headlong into the fanciful realm of recklessly heroic aspirations. He had no leisure to regret what he had lost. He was so wholly and naturally concerned for what he had failed to obtain. He was very far away from me, who watched him across three feet of space. With every instant he was penetrating deeper into the impossible world of romantic achievements. He got to the heart of it at last. A strange look of beatitude overspread his features. His eyes sparkled in the light of the candle burning between us. He positively smiled. He had penetrated to the very heart, to the very heart. It was an ecstatic smile that your faces, or mine either, will never wear, my dear boys. I whisked him back by saying, If you had stuck to the ship, you mean. He turned upon me, his eyes suddenly amazed and full of pain, with a bewildered, startled, suffering face, as though he had tumbled down from a star. Neither you nor I will ever look like this on any man. He shuddered profoundly, as if a cold fingertip had touched his heart. Last of all, he sighed. I was not in a merciful mood. He provoked one by his contradictory indiscretions. It is unfortunate you didn't know beforehand, I said, with every unkind intention, but the perfidious shaft fell harmless, dropped at his feet like a spent arrow, as it were, and he did not think of picking it up. Perhaps he had not even seen it. Presently, lolling at ease, he said, Dash it all, I tell you it bulged. I was holding my lamp along the angle-iron in the lower deck, when a flake of rust as big as the palm of my hand fell off the plate, all of itself. He passed his hand over his forehead. The thing stirred and jumped off like something alive while I was looking at it. That made you feel pretty bad, I observed casually. Do you suppose, he said, that I was thinking of myself, with a hundred and sixty people at my back, all fast asleep in that four-tween deck alone, and more of them aft, more on the deck, sleeping, knowing nothing about it, three times as many as there were boats for, even if there had been time? I expected to see the iron open out as I stood there, and the rush of water going over them as they lay. What could I do? What? I can easily picture him to myself in the peopled gloom of the cavernous place, with the light of the globe-lamp falling on a small portion of the bulkhead that had the weight of the ocean on the other side, and the breathing of unconscious sleepers in his ears. I can see him glaring at the iron, startled by the falling rust, overburdened by the knowledge of an imminent death. This, I gathered, was the second time he had been sent forward by that skipper of his, who, I rather think, wanted to keep him away from the bridge. He told me that his first impulse was to shout, and straightway make all those people leap out of sleep into terror. But such an overwhelming sense of his helplessness came over him, that he was not able to produce a sound. This is, I suppose, what people mean by the tongue cleaving to the roof of the mouth. "'Too dry,' was the concise expression he used in reference to this state. Without a sound, then, he scrambled out on deck through the number one hatch. A windsail down there swung against him accidentally, and he remembered that the light touch of the canvas on his face nearly knocked him off the hatchway ladder. 
He confessed that his knees wobbled a good deal as he stood on the foredeck, looking at another sleeping crowd. The engines having been stopped by that time, the steam was blowing off. Its deep rumble made the whole night vibrate like a bass string. The ship trembled to it. He saw here and there a head lifted off a mat, a vague form uprise in sitting posture, listen sleepily for a moment, sink down again into the billowy confusion of boxes, steam winches, ventilators. He was aware all these people did not know enough to take intelligent notice of that strange noise. The ship of iron, the men with white faces, all the sights, all the sounds, everything on board to that ignorant and pious multitude was strange alike, and as trustworthy as it would forever remain incomprehensible. It occurred to him that the fact was fortunate. The idea of it was simply terrible. You must remember he believed, as any other man would have done in his place, that the ship would go down at any moment. The bulging, rust-eaten plates that kept back the ocean fatally must give way, all at once like an undermined dam, and let in a sudden and overwhelming flood. He stood looking at these recumbent bodies, a doomed man aware of his fate, surveying the silent company of the dead. They were dead. Nothing could save them. There were boats enough for half of them, perhaps, but there was no time. No time. No time. It did not seem worth while to open his lips, to stir hand or foot. Before he could shout three words or make three steps, he would be floundering in a sea, whitened awfully by the desperate struggles of human beings, clamorous with the distress of cries for help. There was no help. He imagined what would happen perfectly. He went through it all motionless by the hatchway with the lamp in his hand. He went through it to the very last harrowing detail. I think he went through it again while he was telling me these things. He could not tell the court. I saw as clearly as I see you now that there was nothing I could do. It, it seemed to take all the life out of my limbs. I thought I might just as well stand where I was and wait. I did not think I had many seconds. Suddenly the steam ceased blowing off. The noise, he remarked, had been distracting, but the silence at once became intolerably oppressive. I thought I would choke before I got drowned, he said. He protested he did not think of saving himself. The only distinct thought formed, vanishing and reforming in his brain was— Eight hundred people and seven boats. Eight hundred people and seven boats. Somebody was speaking aloud inside my head, he said a little wildly. Eight hundred people and seven boats. And no time. Just think of it. He leaned toward me across the little table, and I tried to avoid his stare. Do you think I was afraid of death? He asked in a voice very fierce and low. He brought down his open hand with a bang that made the coffee cups dance. I am ready to swear I was not. I was not. By God, no! He hitched himself upright and crossed his arms. His chin fell on his breast. The soft clashes of crockery reached us faintly through the high windows, there was a burst of voices, and several men came out in high good humor into the gallery. They were exchanging jocular reminiscences of the donkeys in Cairo. A pale, anxious youth stepping softly on long legs was being chaffed by a strutting and rubicund globe-trotter about his purchases in the bazaar. "'No, really, do you think I've been done to that extent?' he inquired, very earnest and deliberate. The band moved away, dropping into chairs as they went. Matches flared, illuminating for a second, faces without the ghost of an expression, and the flat glaze of white shirt-fronts. The hum of many conversations, animated with the ardor of feasting, sounded to me absurd and infinitely remote. Some of the crew were sleeping on the number one hatch, 
within reach of my arm, began Jim again. You must know they kept Kalashi watch in that ship, all hands sleeping through the night, and only the reliefs of quartermasters and lookout men being called. He was tempted to grip and shake the shoulder of the nearest Lascar, but he didn't. Something held his arms down along his sides. He was not afraid, oh, no. Only he just couldn't, that's all. He was not afraid of death, perhaps. But I'll tell you what, he was afraid of the emergency. His confounded imagination had evoked for him all the horrors of panic, the trampling rush, the pitiful screams, boats swamped, all the appalling incidents of a disaster at sea he had ever heard of. He might have been resigned to die, but I suspect he wanted to die without the added terrors, quietly, in a sort of peaceful trance. A certain readiness to perish is not so very rare, but it is seldom you meet men whose souls, steeled in the impenetrable armor of resolution, are ready to fight a losing battle to the last. The desire of peace waxes stronger as hope declines, till at last it conquers the very desire of life. Which of us here has not observed this, or maybe experienced something of that feeling in his own person? this extreme weariness of emotions, the vanity of effort, the yearning for rest. Those striving with unreasonable forces know it well, the shipwrecked castaways in boats, wanderers lost in a desert, men battling against the unthinking might of nature or the stupid brutality of crowds. End of chapter 7